Hello, my name is Dr. James Santa. I'm the Director of International Academics of the Common Mission Project, and this is Concept 5. And in Concept 5, we're going to be covering two distinct areas of the Lean Launch Pad and H4 methodology, which is viability, so the bottom two boxes of the Mission Model Canvas, and the minimum viable product. Now, you've heard me talk about the minimum viable product and, and the uh, several the other concepts. We're going to talk about it more in depth here today. So viability, again, the bottom two boxes here, it, and the, read out the definition here for you again. So it refers to the evaluation of whether a proposed solution, intervention, or product can achieve its intended impact and fulfill the mission of sustainability and efficiency. It takes into account the necessary investments required to develop, deploy, and maintain the innovation, as well as the potential mission benefits and impact generated by the mission model. So one of the ways that I would frame this to you, and now this has to do with a for-profit venture, but bear with me here on this example, is think about when you buy a cell phone. It's not enough that you just bought the phone. You have to usually, uh, at least you have, unless you have a, a resource that I don't have, is there is a service fee that's associated with using that cell phone on a monthly basis. So that it could get include the warranty on the device, it could include uh, just being able to access the, uh, the network, being able to get on the internet, all those different things. So it's not enough that you buy a phone. There are supports that have to come with it, and those costs have to be accounted for at the beginning of the undertaking of a project rather than somewhere else uh, in the process. So keep that in mind. So viability is really not looking at what's it going to take for this to get out there today, but what's going to happen a year from now when more users are, are actually accessing um, this policy, this process, these technologies, whatever it may look like. So just another again, as a total mission model canvas, these last uh, two boxes are there at the bottom. Cost. So uh, read out definition and give you a little bit of an uh, example here. What's the difference between a for-profit venture versus something usually that's traditionally in the impact space? So these are the financial resources and expenditures required at every phase of the discovery process to carry out the organization's mission deliver its value proposition, and execute its key activities. It encompasses the estimation, allocation, and management of funds necessary for implementing the organization's strategies, products, services, or interventions to achieve the desired impact on its beneficiaries. Now, one of the things that's really important about these, uh, you know, if you're working with the government or you're working for an organization that is not predominantly focused on revenue, uh, is these things, instead of making money necessarily, money. So a good example that you can think about this, and this gets in the news quite frequently, is the post office in the United States, as an example. So and oftentimes we hear that the post office is losing money. And that's really a bit disingenuous at best to frame it that way. The post office and those services cost money. Now, they may seem semantical, but the difference there is quite important. It's just to keep in mind that these services require funding and they cost money versus being a revenue gen. Obviously, some of those activities can uh, generate revenue for the operations of that organization, but they're not necessarily being driven to be a for revenue venture. They are there to provide a, an integral service to uh, those key beneficiaries. And for those of us in the United States or anywhere with a, with a public mail service, those really are the taxpayer. So keep that in mind. And it's not just what does it cost to, you know, in this case, we say deliver mail, but it's everything else that goes along with it. So those have to be accounted for. So it's not just paying the salaries and, and getting the delivered what that looks like the physical um, assets that are required to do that but think about you know, the vehicles and the maintenance and the training and all the price of printing stamps they all come into play here so you have to account for all of those costs one of the suggestions that we give and we'll get into uh, dual use in a, in a future uh, concept session but one of the ways we think about dual use what does that really mean so dual use is the idea that, that a service or product is uh, has the capability to be used not just in the, in the government sector but also could be used privately and a good example of that one that we're probably all familiar with going back to the smartphone example is a gps global positioning satellites so those were first developed to be used for military purposes but now we have GPS that has been integrated into every walk of our lives, whether it's, you know, uh, navigating a new city or a new town you're with, or just being able to pinpoint your location because you're ordering a uh, delivery food service, for example. So that's a, that's a, uh, a good example. Use, but there are both private, uh, you know, civilian uses as well as those for within the government world. Um, and venture capitals are a great place for this because they're often 
where how can revenue be offset um, one way or the other, whether it's going to be used for uh, driving mission achievement in a government or NGO, or it could be used for something that you could sell to generate revenue. And venture capitals generally have a pretty good framework for deploying those types of frameworks to actually getting a dual use capability. So if you're working with the federal government or even just ancillary to the federal government, it's important to know on paper what the uh, budget appropriations process looks like. Uh, anybody who's been paying attention to the news for the last decade or so is going to be familiar that this is typically a broken process. Um, but on paper, this is how it's supposed to work. So you'll notice that July through February, uh, the executive branch is going to be working through their own budgeting process. And then starting in March and through, uh, through June, you're to have where the legislative process is going to come into play and do their own evaluation, their own earmarks, their own pork barreling, and you name it, this is going on in the legislative process. And then what ends up happening are supposed to happen through July through October, and the fiscal year for the federal government in the United States ends on September 30th, is that Congress is supposed to finalize the Now, this is on paper. In practice, this doesn't always happen, and we hear about it in the news. I'm not going to be a pragmatist here about our government's operations, but I am going to say is please be aware that there is a process that is generally followed for our budgeting and appropriations, at least in the United States. Uh, and this is another example of uh, purchasing uh, authority thresholds, as it says there on your screen. But let's just keep in mind that there are lots of different ways of being able to get funding in order to put a uh, one of these groups into practice and creating a business. And just know that different types of organizations different budgeting thresholds. And if you're working with a, um, you know, at the demo phase or working with a small organization uh, that's maybe primarily focused on uh, small scale research and development, your funding capabilities are going to be far less than say you're working with one of those big uh, government prime organization, millions and millions of dollars in contracts, and they are uh, constantly looking towards for future integration for new technology, the new processes with their partners. So just keep that in mind. Um, but, you know, if you're going to start a business with this and, you, and you're and you thinking about what ideas we have here, um, or you're working with an organization, say your sponsor is um, at that R&D level, they're a little bit more, a uh, little bit smaller than, say, uh, these organizations working with these big defense primes, for an example, uh, just know what your budgeting capabilities may look like. And this is another uh, example of a, of a budgeting opportunity, and this is called an other transaction uh, authority or an OTA. And this just shows that there are ways of being able to have innovative new features and tools and resources and policies brought into the federal workspace in the United States uh, through this OTA process. And it's just an opportunity to kind of that glass floor a lot easier than it would be traditionally about starting a firm that can do business with the federal government in the United States. The other thing about with your deployment is we've talked about in the previous concept is that this is not something we're looking at doing over the next 10 years. Not that that's not an important thing to keep in mind, but what can we deliver quickly? And these different will show you how this works. The SBIR, the small business um, uh, funding, is going to allow you to operate for about a year. And then you've got the S&T have a couple of years of funding and the same thing with existing contracts, depending on their period of performance. And any uh, calls they can get to actually have uh, additional years in the contract you're looking at, uh, maybe two years as well. So just know, again, so when you're talking with your sponsor, well, what kind of contracting vehicles do you have and what kind of funding would you have available uh, just to get an idea of where they operate within this space? And this is a, an example of a Gantt chart. So this is one of the tools that the student teams can use to actually see what tasks have to happen when, which tasks can happen uh, in parallel with one another, and which tasks are unique and have to be, everything else before them has to be done before you can move on to the next one. And this slide is very similar to that, where it just shows a different version of the visual. I'm not suggesting that you become an expert in MS project, for example. Uh, these can be done very simply in Excel or one of the free versions of those tools. And all you want to be able to show to your sponsoring organization is this is what a timeline and here's responsible for those tasks at which point and which tasks are milestones and which ones can happen in tandem to one another. So moving into mission achievement. So this is the value you're creating for the sum of all beneficiaries for the greater good. So this is the sum. So keep this in mind when you're going to uh, your discovery that when you find a saboteur, for example, is that even though this is better for the organization, for a group of individuals or a single ind individual. This is why it's integral for you to actually know who your saboteurs are early on. So the last 
glass bullet. This can be challenging to measure. Now, when you're looking at an organization that's talking about their financial impact is their revenue generating is that's a pretty easy metric. How would their growth, how much revenue do they bring in this month? What's their new customer segments that they brought in? Those kind of things. But mission achievement uh, for an NGO or a government organization can be more difficult to measure. But think about it this way. If you're working with the Department of Defense, lives saved can be an excellent uh, measure that you can use here. Um, the casualty reduction, you can use um, their time of being able to respond to emergencies, those kind of things. So be thinking about this and you can validate whether those measures are appropriate by your beneficiary discovery, as well as talking with your sponsoring organization. And lastly, this here is a what we call in the United States a baseball card. But this, uh, if you're working, if you're watching this from the UK, for example, this can be a football card. And all this really is is a single tool that you can provide to any individual that's interested in your program. Uh, generally, your sponsoring organization, perhaps your mentors, that would be able to show everything the value that you're bringing into the organization if your solution was to be implemented not least here is a finalized version of the mission model canvas and you'll notice that all the color coding here this is from the same team that we're seeing here and giving you a really good example of how a really well thought out mission model canvas can look at the end of your quarter or semester or if you're doing this in a condensed version of this course that much more quickly so i absolutely suggest that you look at this as a resource and use it as a visual aid for you as you're filling out your mmc on this is what a good one can look like so what we're going to move into part two of this session is going to be the minimum viable product. Now, this comes from another one of our uh, Hacking for Defense team. They conducted their discovery, and what they were able to do is they came up with a really plausible MMC, or MVP, excuse me, to give back to their organization. And this one is in particularly of interest to me because what they were working with was the repatriation of American remains from uh, Korea and Vietnam. Uh, there's a group in the army that is primarily responsible for the activity. And through their research, what the students found is that, you know, if we just purchase an off the shelf uh, customer relationship management system like Salesforce, it would meet the goals of this organization. And the organization was just unaware that this existed in the way that they could use it to actually do what they needed very quickly. So rather than build something new, they just said, hey, you know what, we can, we can work with a vendor that already has the tools we need. So what is a minimum viable product? It's um, the concise summary of the smallest possible group of features that will work as a standalone product while still core problems and demonstrating the solution's value. So this is not a this 100% meeting the mark. This is what can we do that's going to do 80 or 90% of the solution domain that meets the core needs of our beneficiaries. It doesn't have to be anything physical. It can be a drawing. It can be a wireframe. There's lots of ways to, uh, to uh, look at this. And I'm going to show you example that comes from the uh, requirements engineering literature that will help, su help support your journey about building a minimum viable product. The reason we suggest doing a minimum viable product eliminates as much waste as possible. So what we're suggesting here, and this visual may be uh, familiar to you, is that we're not suggesting and we're advising you not to start at going in after number five. You're going to start with the skateboard, number one. If we're looking at transportation and you need to get from place A to B, and depending on the, the the distance that you have to travel, maybe a skateboard is just good enough for right now. And if you can build that in a month and say, you know what, this is going to meet your needs for right now, and we're going to continue learning about our user experience, and then come back and continue to iterate and build more. That's what you're looking to do here. And your MVP quite literally could be as simple as this drawing. We're starting with stage one. We're going to continue our discovery, continue our learning, bring that scooter in, get to the bicycle. And then maybe you realize, you know what, all they really need was a bicycle. So it's a good thing that we didn't try to build the car first because and, and the way that we addressed the pains of this particular group of beneficiaries had we gone to the most technology savvy or technologically savvy device case. So other thing is MVPs are not prototypes. That misconception out of the way right now. MVPs are whatever gets the team to look at hypothesis with the, the smallest expenditure of reason. It is not a product that you're demonstrating to beneficiaries and it does not require a physical manifestation. I'm gonna show you again, as I mentioned previously, what this could look like in practice. So 
this is just another map of requirements engineering and layers and layers, excuse me, and showing you how this can all look. So going from what the, the stakeholders require all the way down to the components and what that looks like and where it exists along the way. But the one that I want to bring your attention to is this next one. And this comes from the same requirements engineering literature. And it kind of the problem domain, which you're going to be predominantly focusing your, uh, your work on, your beneficiary discovery, is um, that first one, the stakeholder requirements, your beneficiaries. State what the stakeholders want to achieve through use of the system and avoid reference to any particular solution. Being agnostic, um, not, in the, not in the religious sense, but agnostic to what the solution looks like. What would meet your needs? And that's what you're trying to find out. And then it moves through as you some requirements, which move more into the solution domain, and then obviously the architectural design, which is also solution domain. But how could this look in practice? I recommend that you start with this idea of a black box. So this comes from a waste processing plant example from this literature. And you'll notice when you're looking at this black box that there's a whole to it, and there's stuff that's coming out. But inside of this box, we know there are but we're not exactly sure what those things are. Well, this is your first really good stab at creating a minimum viable product is we have some inputs and we have a pretty good idea of what that we want to have happen when this is working well, but we don't know what's happening in the middle. That's okay. This is your first version of your MVP. So think about this. And what we're going to do here is kind of go into those idea of those Eastern European nesting dolls. So what would this look like They're out? Well, right here. So as you could do your beneficiary discovery and work through your MVP testing, you're going to find out, okay, so we've got a really good initial black box. Look like we know what the desired outputs look like. What's happening inside of that black box? Well, inevitably, more black boxes. So this is your second level MVP. So you've done some more discovery work. You've, you've validated and invalidated some hypotheses along the way. And what you found is here's what's happening inside this particular black box. But there's still more unknown there, which means you have to conduct more discovery. So by the end of the semester, in the quarter, end of your program, this is what an MVP could look like. Now, notice that there are still plenty of black boxes here. But what the researchers here have done and what you student teams is being able to get a little bit more into the weeds and the detail of what this black box is doing underneath that uh, initial surface that we saw when you look back at that first visual. So keep this in mind as you're going through your, uh, your iteration your beneficiary discoveries, this doesn't have to be anything exceedingly technical or difficult to conceptualize. It can be as simple as a drawing on a page. And in this case, the idea of how the black uncovered, 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 until we really see what's happening underneath that surface and providing much better insights into the problem and potentially the solution domain. So this comes from the literature as well from Robin Goldsmith in 2004. But what was put here is this is a way that you can actually go about understanding your MVP in more depth and understanding your problem in more depth. So the first thing you have to do is identify what the real problem is. That's your discovery. The second thing you're going to do is, again, via your beneficiary discovery is what, how are they measuring that the problem is real? So it's not just enough to say, oh, I've got this problem. It's, well, can you demonstrate that to me? And how, do you, how are you operating within these constraints today? The next thing is, is are your gains? Identify the goals that you'd like to see if you were able to get this problem uh, solved. Again, going back to your value proposition con uh, canvas. The next thing you're, you're going to do is your as is of the problems. So what are the root causes here? That comes through your beneficiary discovery. Um, then you're going to go back to it is it's defined the what's must be delivered. So your value proposition is there. And then at the end of the day, you're going to have the inputs for your MVP that's going to specify to look to meet those real needs. And this is another example of a minimal product that you're actually going to have um, from a Stanford team. And this is from Hacking for Defense. And you can see they did 125 interviews. They really, really got down into the weed particular problem. And this one had to do with, at least initially, was given to them by the medical officers in the Navy SEALs was, well, we are worried about hypothermia for the the that are in their submarines and having to swim to their missions. And we want to have a device that's able to measure how they're doing physiologically so that if they are starting to get off mission. Now, if you've never had the fortune of meeting it and working with any special operations soldiers or sailors in this case, you'll know that if you put a device pulled off a mission, that particular device, at least here with the Navy SEALs, is going to end up at the bottom of the ocean. And through their discovery, they realized the root cause with hypothermia was the fact that the navigation systems were not working as they needed them to work, the, the Navy SEALs being they, and they came up with a MVP 
um, and allow the Navy SEALs to unencumbered get to their mission objective. So this is the power of the hacking for method and getting out of the classroom and conducting your discovery. And that is the end of this concept. We'll see you on the next one.